We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Guys, hello everyone. I think unfortunately, we, we cannot count with Mr. Yasin Aslam. He, he got ill last night. He prob he's testing to check if it's COVID at this moment. And uh, we, we may start, that we can have more time to discuss, but we hope that Mr. Thomas Unendorsen representative from the Fellwork Foundation, also be able to join us. Uh, he, he didn't reply so far. So please, Rafael Evangelista, uh, thank you. No okay, thank you, Alexandre. Uh, so, good afternoon. Welcome to the workshop 232 of the Internet Governance Forum 2021. The title of this workshop is Mind the Gap, Digital Labor and International Frameworks. My name is Rafael Evangelista. I'm an anthropologist and professor at the State University of Campinas uh, in Brazil. I'm also a member of the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee, the CGI.br, uh, representing the academic sector. I'll be the moderator uh, of this session. And here with us, we have Uma Rani from the International Labor Organization. We have also Alina Moraiti, who is a collaborator with the ILO. And uh, we are expecting to have with us also Rafael Groman, professor at Unicinos in Brazil, uh, also representing DG Labor. Uh, Yasin Aslam, we were expecting him, but he is ill, so he will not join us today. And he was supposed to represent the United Kingdom Uber's Drivers Union, but uh, unfortunately he, he couldn't make it. And we are also expecting Thomas Annie Dorson from Fair Work Foundation to join, to, uh, join us uh, later. So uh, this is how we're going to go. The workshop is organized in five sections of discussions. First, we're going to have Uma Rani. Uh, we will open the debate, presenting as a global overview of digital platform impacts and the ILO uh, and how ILO is addressing the digital labor challenges. Then we will have a theoretical discussion led by Rafael Groman and Alina Moraiti. Um, bringing up some insights on the concept of decent work and how it has been applied in the internet scope. Uh, they will address some of the impacts of the digital labor platforms in working conditions in the global south as well. And following that, we will have a more empirical discussion. It was supposed to be with Yasin Aslan and Thomas Annie Dorson, but now we're gonna just have Thomas uh, giving us some concrete examples of potential resistance tacti tactics to prevent the deterioration of digital labor conditions. Then we will have an open discussion kindly moderated by Uma Rani. So please prepare your questions and uh, for that moment and send us that question, those, those questions. This is gonna be very important for us. And finally, to wrap up, we will have a, a brief uh, co -close, concluding, uh, closing remarks by the panelists uh, since we don't have uh, Yasin with us, I think it's it's uh, okay to say that you can have some uh, extra minutes. Uh, so feel free to expand your ideas. Uh, before giving the, the floor to Marani, let me briefly introduce the topic just to give you all some uh, context. Uh, the emergence of platform-based business models has contributed to the increase of informality and the deterioration of employment conditions. 
the fragmentation of production press process, a direct conse consequence of technological advancement, has led to more unstable employment and income. The ILO, the International Labour Organization, has developed, has developed frameworks and partnered with local and international organizations to contribute with policymaking in order to ensure decent digital work. However, there are mismatches between international and local policies in terms of both digital and labor regulations that must be identified and addressed. This is one of our goals today. The workshop aims at discussing digital policy alternatives to improve the digital platform's role in providing pro productive employment rights, safety, and non-exploitative -explo work. To do so, the workshop will address the following, following issues. A, to present an overall impact of the inter internet economy to labor conditions with an emphasis on the global south. B, access, access the ILO's uh, framework to cope with the challenge of digital platforms, uh, digital platform labor, and how it has been used in different regions and stakeholders. And C, discuss possible new policy perspectives to address the challenges of a changing scenario in the labor field. So here today, we expect to, respect to one, explore the limits of the ILO framework uh, on increasing investment in decent and sustainable work for the digital age. And two, organize a set of possible new policy perspectives to address potential, potential mismatch between local digital labor policies and international frameworks, also considering connectivity issues. Also, as a member of the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee, let me add that it's our goal to bring this agenda to the field of the internet governance forums and particularly to the discussions carried out by the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee. Our perspective today is the perspective of the Global South region, which plays a major role in terms of digital labor and also uses, usage of digital platform services. So without further ado, I'll, I give the floor to Uma Reni. Please, Uma. Uh, thank you. Uh, your mic, it's off. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Rafael, for introducing me and also for setting the context. And it's a pleasure to be here and to talk to you all. What I thought I would do is, instead of using a presentation today, actually give you a quick uh, roadmap of what's been happening in the world with regard to the digital economy and digital labor platforms. As you all know, uh, ILO recently actually launched a major flagship report, the World Employment Social Outlook 2021 on role of digital labor platforms in transforming the world of work. What it went about doing there was basically outlining why there is a rise in the digital economy. What are the factors that have contributed to it? What does a platform business model look like? And what are the implications of such a business model on the workers and what have countries been doing with regard to actually addressing some of the issues related to the working conditions of the workers. And it goes about laying it down 15 recommendations that not only fall within the, uh, within the field of labor law, but also touches upon competition law and other laws, emerging laws relating to algorithm. It very rightly goes about pointing out uh, based on data that it has collected for this particular report that, you know, these platforms have been rising and it shows that it is a five-fold increase. So this is not a phenomena that is small, but it is a growing phenomena. And one of the reasons why it has been largely growing is because of the availability of cloud infrastructure and cloud storage, which has actually allowed businesses to come in and set up because it's a very low entry cost phenomena today. So that's why you see in some sense, these platforms coming up in a big way. And you also have venture capitalists who are actually interested in investing in these because there's always this notion that exists that 
If one platform can actually dominate and monopolize, labor, uh, monopolize the markets across the world, then you can win as a result of it and you can have huge gains, uh, capital gains as a result of it. So this is what has been one of the motivations around it. But what it also shows about, shows the report shows is that there is a huge digital divide that exists both in, in terms of you know, the kind of investments that are being put in, but also where these enterprises are being set up. So they are largely dominated in United States, China, and a couple of other countries where you have huge investments coming in. While you know, much of the other global South countries, whether you're talking about Latin America, Africa, or Middle East, it's a very small proportion. It's only about 4% of the, uh, 4 of the investment. Now, these platforms, I think for us as a labor organization from where we come, they are transforming the world of work. And I think that's why we are getting into this issue. That is why, that is where our concern is. There are three ways in which they transform. And I think this is very fundamental and important for us to understand. The first one is, you know, the algorithmic management practices that has been introduced along with this model is very new. It, this, it's a huge departure from what we know of the human management practices that many traditional companies had. And you have, whether it is allocation of work, whether it's monitoring, whether it's evaluation, and finally, the reward of work, all of that is algorithmically managed. Now, this has huge implications. Now, this has implications in terms of, you know, who is going to get the work, and who's going to get the work is dependent upon your ratings. So the evaluation uh, metrics that is used is ratings. If you have a very good ratings, then you can get the work, but it's not enough. You have platforms in freelance where you could have a very good ratings, but you might not have the ability to pay to actually uh, put your proposals or to actually try to get your uh, proposals recognized at the top. And as a result, you might not get it. And this is something we have seen systematically workers from Global South not being able to bid for certain proposals or you know, highlight the proposals for them to get the job. Now, while ratings is very important, and you know, there's this whole notion that exists with the platform saying that you have the flexibility, you have the freedom to, you know, take whatever job you want when you want. And we have seen repeatedly through our surveys that we have done with both the taxi and the delivery workers that when a worker gets a, a taxi driver gets a ride or a worker gets an order, they have few seconds, 15 to 40 seconds to decide whether they take it or not. And if they decide not to take that particular right or order, there is a penalization or a punishment that happens. And that takes the form of you not being able to access more work in future. It could last from a day to months. You could be deactivated. And more importantly, your ratings come down. So it has a huge impact on the same uh, performance evaluator that you're talking about. Now, all of this, what does that mean for the worker? It means that it's difficult for them to access work. You can get deactivated at a click of a button without even knowing why that was there. And it has a huge implication on the earnings of many of these workers. And we have also seen that on some platforms such as Microtask, the entire evaluation process is algorithmically determined, where you have an algorithm deciding whether the task you did was right or wrong. And if it decides it is wrong, the work is rejected, you're not paid payment. And not only that, you know, you have certain mechanisms that are set up in the platform, in the design where, you know, every task is said, it will take so much time. It might take actually more than that time, but it is clocked in a way that you have to finish the work within that time. If you don't finish, the work is off. But you have no mechanism to talk to a human being on these platforms 
to discuss what needs to be done about it. You know, the communication flow does not exist, whether when your task is rejected or when the work disappears or whether you're deactivated. And I think this is fundamental that you see in all of the platforms that are there. So I think this is important because this has implications on the kind of pay or earnings you earn by the end of the day. Because you do not earn enough, you actually end up working very long hours. This is particularly a big problem that we have seen when you talk about taxi and delivery workers. When many global South countries, you know, the number of hours they work is about 69 on taxi and 59 on delivery, which is huge, which is far above the limits uh, uh, put by the Working Hours Convention of the ILO. Now, the second shift that you see is how the platforms, you know, it's very celebrated that platforms are asset light. They're asset light largely because they're shifting the entire responsibility of capital. Whether you're talking about a taxi or whether you're talking about a computer on an online platform onto the worker. So as a result, they do not have to make the investments and also the risks that are associated with it, whether you have a regularity of work, whether you have jobs or if there is other risks that are there, this is not what a platform actually uh, takes on itself. It's all pushed onto the workers. So this is one of the major shifts that we see. And that is something that we really need to think about because this is changing what a definition of a firm is and what the boundaries of the firm are. And I think for us, it's quite important to look at that. The third, which is again from an ILO point of view is very important is, you know, we all talk about duality, right? Uh, especially when you're in the global South countries, duality is part and parcel of our life because informality exists in various forms in the labor market. But what's very interesting with the platform business model is it creates duality through the platform business model itself. So it has a core workforce whom it employs to actually set up all the technology and to manage the workers. And then you have the whole services that is actually outsourced. So they become mediators in actually getting the work done. So this is fundamental change that you see. And this is something which is what has led to a huge debate across a number of countries in the world saying that, you know, given the nature of tasks that these workers perform, you know, they should be classified as employees because uh, algorithm directs you, it allocates tasks, it directs how you should do it. And you have monitoring mechanisms through different software, hardware tools, whether on location based or on online based as you know how the task is being done and the whole reward process is dependent on it. So given the way the mechanism functions and the technology actually can help you track all of this. So, you know, this is very clearly a relationship of that of an employee and not that of an self-employed or an independent contractor. So this is a fundamental issue of misclassification or doing a correct classification that needs to be uh, taken into consideration. I think uh, these are broadly the kind of issues which you very clearly see emanating from the platform business model. Now, what the platforms have done very smartly is that they have the terms of service agreement, which actually goes about defining what the working conditions of the workers would be. They, they lay it down and these terms of service agreement are unilaterally determined by them without having a social dialogue with the governments or with the workers, uh, worker associations or worker unions or whatsoever. So this creates quite a bit of problem because you, know, you can unilaterally determine what can change at what point of time and what not. And this is not an easy access that a worker has to actually negotiate or bargain because your negotiating is basically when you log into an account, you accept everything. Otherwise you can't get work or you cannot get an account. So, you know, there's no point of negotiation that exists anywhere within that. So uh, uh, what we have tried to do is we have tried to do a survey of about 12,000 workers across the globes 
uh, also specifically focusing for taxi and delivery in the global south countries. And what we clearly find is huge challenges with regard to low pay, uh, not having enough to earn, long working hours, having issues around occupational safety and health, and the implications of algorithmic management practices on workers, which leads to a huge stress on many of them. Uh, one of the things that we do, and this is very important for us, is to look at what is it in the legislative sphere or, uh, you know, that needs to be done. And here we have a whole dedicated chapter which looks at different conventions and recommendations of the ILO. And uh, there are the fundamental principles and rights at work of the ILO which are actually applicable to all workers, irrespective of what your contractual status is. It doesn't matter whether you are classified as an employee or a self-employed, that is applicable to you. Now, after that, you have a number, and I think my colleague Alina is going to talk a bit more into the details of that, but you also have other key labor standards actually, which which is applicable to workers irrespective of your contractual status. This is like the occupational uh, safety and health, social security, employment, uh, uh, employment and job creation, and labor inspection. All of this is applicable to all. It, it doesn't differentiate whether which kind of an employment status that you are basically in. And then there are certain principles that are there actually that are also applicable. And this relates to that of fair termination, who will have access to data and who will not. And then the kind of payment systems that are there. All of this is again applicable to all workers. So I think what's interesting is that there are conventions, there are recommendations, there are principles that are there in the ILO, which could be easily adopted to ensure that workers have decent working conditions. But because the workers, because the platforms are using the terms of service agreement, now this becomes very important. Now, what we have also seen is that countries have adopted varying mechanisms to actually address this issue of working conditions, but it is all very piecemeal. What's quite interesting to see is in the global south, much of it is around occupational safety and health and social security, while that in global north is much more around the employee employment relationship and uh, much of it coming out of court and judicial decisions based on the autonomy and control that is there. So, Given the kind of uh, variation that is there and the regulatory uncertainty that is there, the ILO actually calls for an international policy dialogue and coordination so as to have at the international global level a dialogue with the workers, governments and platform companies to discuss about the various issues related to working conditions, not only within the labor law, but emerging law of algorithms and competition law. Because if you start classifying workers as self-employed, then the right to collectively bargain is part of the competition law. So that needs to be brought into. So one of the next steps of the ILO is to have a technical expert meeting, which has now been approved by the governing body. And this will be held next year, uh, the second half. And we look forward to having a very productive discussion to see how to take the issues relating to this forward. And lastly, let me end by saying that the EU legislative is coming, is out. And I think it gives us quite a bit of thought with regard to what needs to be done moving forward with this issue. So thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Uma. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'll uh, give the floor so to Rafael. Maybe we can start with you. And, yeah. Uh, thanks, Rafael, for, for being with us today. Yeah. Please. Hello, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you for the invitation, Rafael, Alexandre, and people from, from Brazil. I, I agree totally with uh, Uma Rani in, in this explanation about um, international frameworks. And 
I will talk a little bit about my my work on Digital Labor Research Lab here in 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 Brazil, and some theoretical perspectives and my experiences also in Fair Work Project. Um, first of all, um, the I I I I want to to think about the names uh, about platform labor and what's what's the names to to understand platform labor and how gig economy expression is a little bit wrong about global south perspectives and global south framework because uh, gig economy is not a novelty in global south because gig is historically uh, a norm of working class people in many countries or many countries of global south. So for me, a gig economy is an Eurocentric uh, expression to name some few cities in the world and try to totalize this. And so uh, uh, for uh, uh, people from Brazil, for instance, uh, the novelty is not a gig uh, because gig is historically at the norm uh, for survival, but the novelty is the subsumption of the control of digital platforms to 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 exploit and control the work. It's not exactly the gig itself. It, for me, it, it's it, it's it's very important to to put in, in into discussion. Uh, other two things about uh, about uh, understanding platform labor from from global south is that global south is not the same everywhere. Uh, in, in 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 the the fair work we are uh, seeing uh, many perspectives in the global south or even Latin America and Africa. Uh, there are many different scenarios uh, around uh, uh, platform labor. And another thing is that uh, the Global South is not exotic. We are not exotic because many uh, uh, research uh, put uh, the frameworks of platform labor in Global South as hidden labor or hidden workers or ghost workers or, or something like this. And my colleague Nopur Raval from India uh, uh, invite us to, to think about uh, the political and ethical consequences naming workers as invisibles and how this hidden labor or ghost workers frameworks can be also Eurocentric perspectives. Oh, I'm from Global North and I'm uh, um, and these are invisible workers, and I, I'm a journalist or a researcher saying that, oh, see these invisible workers here. So we can move beyond uh, this uh, hidden or ghost or invisible perspectives around platform labor, because people can work for Amazon Mechanical Turk for click farm platforms from their homes but they are not invisibles and they are not ghosts. And, and this can be a, a, a third, a, a decent work uh, standard. So for me, uh, uh, a great uh, theoretical challenges is how uh, uh, platformization of work means a growing dependency and the, the focused on dependency of digital platforms and there are mechanisms like uh, data vacation, like algorithmic management and surveillance of workers uh, to, in this dependence is to achieve work activities. And these digital labor platforms presents a diversity, a multiplicity of profiles of platforms, of design of, and of profile, different profiles of workers to regarding, um, work in of riders or drivers and regarding micro workers or regarding uh, click farms or even 
regarding the, the work of streamers, YouTubers, influencers, sex workers, who also depend on digital platforms and are also organizing uh, struggles, organizing associations and, and, and so on. And, and with different perspectives, but uniting uh, regarding this dependency on platform mechanisms. So uh, click farm platforms, for instance, in, in, in Brazil, we have many click farm platforms who, whose workers are paying to click, follow um, Instagram profiles or TikTok accounts to boost uh, social media accounts for politicians, influencers, and celebrities remain uh, uh, remind us that they have connections between platform labor and disinformation for hire, or or platform labor and and political uh, communication and and so on. And one of the challenges here uh, is how to articulate this thing. For, for instance, regulation, public policies, and also the promotion of fair work or decent work. And also how to, to connect the regulation of platform, digital labor platforms and regulation of social media platforms. Since as, uh, there are many workers working for social media platforms with content moderation work, and transcribing videos for TikTok as a recent a piece of uh, Intercept uh, uh, showed. Uh, so we have many challenges regarding this. So I am working with Fair Work Project. It's a, a, a project by, uh, led by University of Oxford and I'm a principal investigator in Brazil. We are an, an action research uh, now in 26 countries around the world, evaluating digital platforms uh, regarding uh, fair work principles. These principles uh, built with many stakeholders, workers associations and ILO and other uh, local stakeholders uh, around the world. And these principles are updated uh, each year, and so we are very open to discuss and 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 update the principles and discuss with with you. And the um, the fair work principles uh, put five many uh, main dimensions around decent work in digital platforms regarding fair pay, including minimum wage and living wage too. Uh, for us, there is a gap even in Brazil regarding data around living wage, what counts as living wage in, in, in Brazil regarding statistics, statistics around that and methodologies for counting living wage in, in Brazil. This is a, a real gap. Uh, the second principle is, is, is around conditions, fair conditions regarding risk, regarding health, uh, including physical and mental health too, and how platforms to, uh, uh, can take proactive measures to protect and promote the health and safety of workers, including data of these workers. It, it, it's so important to us. The, the third principle is uh, fair contracts about terms and conditions uh, should be transparent, always accessible to workers and is free of clauses which unreasonable exclude liability on the part of platforms and should be consistent also with the terms of workers engagement on the platforms to um, independent on the, the classification as workers or, or, or so on. And uh, the, the, the principle four is regarding fair management. Uh, and so platform have to show us due process for decisions affecting workers and workers must have the ability to appeal decisions affecting them such as disciplinary actions, deactivations, 
and the use of algorithms need to be um, a little bit transparent and results in equitable outcomes for workers. And so the platform should be an identifi identifiable and documented policies that ensure equity in regarding gender, race, equity uh, in the way workers are managed on a platform in the higher discipline or fire of workers too. Um, and so the principle five is, is around fair representation. So uh, uh, what's the, the mechanisms which worker voice can be expressed uh, regarding uh, the democratic governance and, and so on and how uh, platforms can ensure a fair representation regarding workers' organization. So uh, these five principles are applying to 20, 26 um, uh, countries now uh, regarding they call gig work and cloud work. I don't agree with this these names because cloud work, the cloud is so material, it's not exactly cloud. And the gig work, I, I was told you about my, my disagreement. But uh, uh, we, we evaluated uh, both uh, rider and, and drivers and also uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk, Workana, and so on regarding also uh, in our uh, reports. So uh, uh, some questions to our panel is that in Latin America, uh, so far, uh, no platform has scored below three in a maximum of 10 points uh, in our recent Fair Work reports in Latin America. Is this different from, uh, uh, in relation to Africa, for instance? Uh, last week, we launched a Ghana report and we have three uh, platforms um, above five points in a maximum of 10. But in, in Latin America, no platforms have reached uh, um, uh, around three or four or, 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 or something like that. And what are the gaps? Maybe the over exploitation of work in this region and how the platforms are over exploited these workers, this, is, this can be uh, a thing, or what's the, uh, how can we move some fair work principles to ensure uh, this, this fair work uh, principles in Latin America? But for me, it's not simple, a simple question to name fair work principle as Eurocentric, for instance, because the platforms, even in Brazil, uh, the platforms are wanting to put alternative fair work principles. I will give an, an example. There, uh, a, a Brazilian think tank uh, is, uh, is building an alternative fair work principles like a, a creating lowered fair work principles. Uh, and, and they want to write a commitment letter uh, to platforms uh, regarding fair work principles in Brazil. For me, this is a, a try to fair washing. This is a, a main concern of, uh, from our side, is how to prevent lobbying and PR actions from platforms regarding fair work principles because we discovered that uh, this think tank want to publish this alternative and lowered uh, fair work principles after our report launching in, in Brazil. And so uh, uh, this type of lobbying and PR actions is a very concern regarding our, uh, our, our tentative in trying to regulate and promote, in real promote decent work. Uh, because the expression, the, the grammar of fair work 
is also on the move of CO2 and how to prevent this fair washing or something like that. And to, to finish, uh, we have to promote and incubate and prototype and accelerate alternative platforms to local platforms, worker-owned platforms, or the, the well-named platform cooperativism. But beyond a New York framework, only by Trevor Show's perspectives, we want to put uh, uh, beyond, uh, um, we want to put principles of platform cooperative from, from the global south and from below. Uh, for instance, the workers, uh, the homeless workers movement in Brazil created an, an application uh, called Hire Who Struggles, connecting uh, workers for homeless worker movements and people who need uh, workers or painters or designers or so on. And it, it, it's an example, neither exactly a platform, neither exactly uh, a co-op, but uh, trying to put and build uh, tech, alternative technologies from below. Uh, and so for me, um, this, there is another gap uh, regarding connecting the connections around workers organizing and workers organizations and uh, open technologies and free technology movements and hacker labs, even in South America and in Latin America with a great history around open and free uh, technologies. Yesterday, a colleague, uh, Karen Gregory, published in Wired an interesting piece uh, regarding worker data science can teach us how to fix the gig economy and our, around worker-led observatories and how this worker data science can improve uh, worker uh, conditions and worker experiences and worker knowledge about their own work. And this can be very powerful. Another important thing, important gap and how to ensure uh, data stewardships and how to promote also data co-ops uh, in, in the platform co-ops and beyond the platform co-ops. So, uh, the data stewardships and data co-ops are uh, uh, a type or a, a trying to fight against data colonialism too. So uh, this, these are my uh, uh, initial thoughts. Thank you so much. Thank you, Grama. Uh, very insightful comments. And I'll just uh, uh, shortly uh, pass the floor to Alina, please. Uh, Alina, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here, please. Hi, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for having me here and thank you for the very interesting presentations, Uma and Rafael. Uh, so my name is Alina. I am an external collaborator at the International Labour Organizations and I have been working on platform work related issues. And in my brief presentation today, I will be picking up from where my colleague, Dr. Umarani, left off, and I will explore two main things. So on the first part, I will examine some examples of local regulatory initiatives in the field of platform work, as well as actions from platforms and social partners in an effort to showcase the diversity of policy action in this area. And in the second part, I will briefly examine some uh, areas of law beyond uh, labor law, primarily data protection and the emerging law of artificial intelligence, which are also very crucial uh, in ensuring decent work uh, on platform work. And so, um, as Dr. Marani pointed out, there are certain principles of decent work uh, which are rooted in ILO instruments and which should apply to workers irrespective of employment status and notwithstanding their often limited scope of applications in ILO instruments. And countries have been very active in um, implementing these principles uh, with regulatory action taking um, roughly three broad firms, forms. 
So the first one is to universalize certain standards. And arguably, this is a more inclusive and effective form of uh, regulation. And it's in line with the spirit of the ILO constitution as well. So one example, uh, in India, for instance, in 2020, the government adopted a code on social security, which applies to all workers, irrespective of employment status. And in a similar vein, uh, in Australia and New Zealand, occupational safety and health laws apply to all workers. And they do that by adopting statutory language, which is more inclusive. So for instance, instead of saying employer and employee, they say a person conducting a business and a worker. Now, the second form of regulatory intervention in the field of platform work is to adopt measures specific to platform workers. And this can happen either by way of state regulation or through a judicial decision. So, um, for instance, in France, uh, the French Labour Code allows self-employed platform workers to engage in collective action, and it also invites uh, platforms to adopt charters, which should include, among other uh, methods to help workers um, obtain a decent price for their services. Uh, another example of a judicial decision this time in Sao Paulo in Brazil, a labor tribunal uh, recognized the right of workers on a delivery platform to have their health risk uh, reduced through health and safety regulations and also recognized the liability of platforms in this area. Now, um, regulatory interventions that are specific to platform workers their main limitation uh, is that they fail to address uh, broader trends of uh, misclassification, informality, for which platform work is arguably only one example. Um, and the final broad form of uh, regulatory intervention in the field of platform work is to reclassify platform workers as employees and therefore to bring them within the remit of labor and social protection. And this again can happen by way of state regulation or judicial decision. So, for example, in Spain earlier this year, there was a law that requires delivery platforms to reclassify their riders as employees. And uh, at the same time, courts all over the world have increasingly been reclassifying workers. And they have been doing that by adapting the constitutive elements of the employment relationship, which are namely direction and control to the realities of platform work. So they have been finding that things like the GPS uh, tracking of platforms, their determination of crucial aspects such as setting the price, matching the users, deactivating users, all of these are indicative of a lack of a true entrepreneurial activity. And so therefore, they are indicative of an employment relationship. Now, the problem with judicial decisions regarding the status of platform workers is that they often conflict with each other and they can create uh, regulatory uncertainty. But at the same time, they're very important because um, gradually they are leading to more inclusive uh, definitions of worker. And that will be crucial to ensuring decent work for emerging firms of work, forms of work. Um, now, social partners and platform companies have also, for their part, been taking action to ensure decent work. Um, so, for instance, an example that is often quoted uh, in the literature is the uh, collective agreement between the United Federation of Danish Workers in Denmark and the Hill for Cleaning platform, which allows workers to transition to an employee status. And when the agreement uh, was passed, more than one third of the platform workers chose this. Um, another example is from Germany, where trade union IG Metall has established a crowdsourcing code of uh, conduct and also an ombuds office that resolves disputes between uh, workers and signatory platforms. Um, now, moving on to the second uh, part of my presentation, the current limitations of regulatory initiatives and of international labor standards to deliver on decent work have often been counterbalanced by developments in other fields of law. And I would briefly like to focus on data protection law and the law of artificial intelligence. So data protection law is um, very important for platform workers. And this is for two reasons. Uh, first of all, because data is central to the business model of platforms. And second of all, because um, data protection laws apply to workers irrespective of their employment status. Um, now, in this field, um, Europe's general data protection regulation is in many ways a standard setter and um, 
what it does is that it lays down a list of individual data rights, um, such as uh, a right to data access, data portability, data erasure, but perhaps most importantly, from a platform work perspective, a right not to be subject to automated decision making. And um, the reason I say this is because um, automated decision making is central to key aspects of platforms operations from setting prices to matching users to deactivating them and so on. So this right really has the potential to uh, address the opacity at the heart of these systems, which is also the root concern of uh, platform workers. And um, the scope of this right was tested earlier this year for the first time in cases brought by Uber and Ola drivers in the Netherlands. And in the case against uh, Ola in particular, which um, concerned a uh, automated system of giving monetary penalties for invalid rights, a court for the first time recognized a right to obtain information, which explained the logic of a um, automated system. Now, rights concerning automated decision-making are also found in data protection laws around the world, but often in more limited scope. So for instance, in the Brazilian G general data protection law, we have a right to review decisions based on automated decision-making. So not a right not to be subject to them uh, to begin with. Um, now, another uh, data-related issue I would like to uh, touch upon is the issue of collective data rights. Because what happens on platforms is that we have the default extraction and ownership of data by the platform themselves, which means that workers are very often unable to leverage the intelligence of their own data to, for instance, engage in effective social dialogue and improve uh, their conditions of work. So we very clearly need a data governance framework that will shift uh, ownership rights to data from the entities that collect it to the individual that produce it. And there have been some uh, regulatory recommendations in this area. So for instance, um, a regulatory committee in India has proposed such a regime. Uh, so collective ownership of community data through measures which include among other mandatory data sharing. And moving on to the final part, um, laws that regulate AI applications are also very important here because as I mentioned, platforms use automated systems and algorithms to determine various aspects of the services. And laws that directly regulate technology hold a great potential to address uh, issues of fairness and transparency on platforms. And though they are at the nascent stage, they are increasingly gaining prominence. So for instance, earlier this year, um, the European Commission adopted a regulatory proposal, which among other, um, imposes certain requirements to uh, artificial intelligence systems that pose a high risk uh, and these are those that we also find in an employment context and these requirements include things such as human oversight uh, enhanced data quality reporting obligations um, and more um, but what i would like to point out is that there is really a need for regulation of ai that comes from the labor sphere as well and which outlines a clear role for uh, social partners vis-a-vis -vis, um, applications, AI applications in the workplace. Um, and to conclude, um, as uh, my colleague Dr. Umarani pointed out, in order to ensure that, um, in order to ensure decent work on platforms, we really need to resolve this issue of regulatory uncertainty that uh, is being created by having a patchwork of regulatory uh, interventions. And to do that, we really need um, some form of uh, international policy dialogue and uh, policy coordination. Um, thank you very much. This, this concludes my presentation. Thank you, Alina. Um, unfortunately, we will not uh, have uh, Thomas with us. So this means that our uh, session that in which uh, we were expecting to have this empirical uh, discussion uh, will not happen. Uh, so we can go directly to our open discussion that uh, will be led by Umarani. So uh, I have some a few questions, but uh, uh, I'll give the floor to you and uh, I'll, I'll address these questions later. So please, Uma. 
And do you want me to take the floor and organize the discussion? Yes. Yes. Can you do okay. that? Yes, sure, Rafael. Happy to do that. Uh, so you've all heard uh, different perspectives with regard to the digital labor platforms and what's been happening to the global south. And I will not disagree with Rafael when he said gig work is not new to global south and it has been there. Yes, we know it in a different way, name. It's called as casual labor because you work based on you know whether you get to work for a couple of hours half a day or full day and this has been pressing for decades or probably centuries in much of the global south and this is coming up as a new phenomenon in uh, global north and that's one reason why it has been picked up as a gig but i think for me one of the most important things and this is something i'd like to put it on the table there are two important points that i would like to put it on to the table so that we could go about discussing now i'm thinking about it from terms of a development trajectory and a development debate within the global south countries where you know there's a larger notion there saying that once you have good levels of education or good education and uh, graduate or a postgraduate, then there is an automatic uh, transfer of that education leading to having a good job in a formal sector with all the benefits and all of it. But what do you see today? And I think this is very important for us to keep that angle in mind. But what you see largely today is that you have very highly educated workforce not finding any employment opportunities, largely because we don't have a proper planning strategy or an employment policy that is there, which tries to see what is the educated workforce coming out, what is the needs of the market, or which is the direction that we need to go. Instead, what has happened is that governments have started to see that, oh, platforms have come in, they can create employment. So let's jump onto the bandwagon. And they're all jumping up and setting up digital infrastructure, promoting all of this, not questioning the platform model itself. And I think that's problematic, according to me. And I think that is something that we need to take head on. And these highly educated workforce, I think uh, Rafael did mention about content moderators and all of that. This highly educated workforce is not able to find employment in their own economies. So they get onto the platform, could be a stopgap or could be a permanency because we have seen through our survey data that workers are working for a very long number of years on this, doing tasks that are far below their skill levels, far below. So there's you know complete mismatch between the education and what they're doing. Like to give you a quick example, IT uh, workers, uh, that is people who have graduated with information technology or computer science are today doing content moderation on online platforms or in new BPOs that have come in. And what is the content moderation they do? They see through thousands of pornographic images, war crime images and hate speeches and check whether they should go or not. Like they've become the new uh, like firewall for the web saying what can go in or what cannot. So, you know, there's a control mechanism that has come in and the, these workers are doing this job. They're young. And I think for me, the fundamental question is, what is the future of them? There's huge psychological impacts that are there as a result of it. So I think the debate for us in the global South is both the quality of work and also the content of work. So, you know, you have, a digital sweatshop of labor coming in today in the global south. And how do we actually handle that? The second point that I do want to raise is something Alina talked about, the need to look at the emerging law of algorithm. And I think this is something that is very, very important because as of now, the algorithms are part of the WTO uh, e-commerce trade routes. They're not part of the labor law. So if algorithm directs, evaluates, monitors, and rewards, that has to be brought into the labor law. And I think that's a discussion, again, that we need to have. So I think with this, I'm going to stop, and I'm going to open up. And please feel free to 
ask questions? Maybe I can start. Is that yes, okay? sure, Rafael. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I have some some comments and questions about uh, many aspects of things that you you said, but maybe I'll just uh, make this this these uh, comments and and I don't know. I, I will not direct. Perhaps I will <laughs> direct any question to uh, anyone, but. I just want to start uh, by commenting on uh, the algorithm issue. Uh, and my question is, uh, do you think that maybe algorithm uh, transparency is an important thing to be, uh, uh, to, to be uh, inserted, to be part of uh, a, a labor regulation in terms of, because if it did, the, the algorithms are, are managing the, the workers and uh, there's no transparency. They, they don't know how they are being managed. Perhaps algorithm transparency uh, can help them to uh, to know uh, mm -hmm. how they are being evaluated, how the, the labor is being allocated and etc. cetera. Um, my second comment is uh, also related to that, uh, is if we, uh, maybe we can think of, uh, uh, in, uh, we can think of, uh, of bringing labor regulations to the discussion of uh, platform regulations, because, you know, I think all, all around the world, governments and, and social movements are discussing how to regulate the platforms. And uh, what do you think of who, who, uh, things also due to the uh, uh, necessity of algorithm transparency in terms of labor regulations, perhaps we should uh, uh, bring this, this discussion also to the platform regulations, which, which is uh, uh, what is the best uh, axis of, uh, to have all these this regulations. And, um, uh, and I, now I have this 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 uh, comment that perhaps is more direct directly to to directed to uh, my colleague Rafael, also Rafael. Uh, but this this touches some points that you have been uh, commenting uh, until now. Uh, we have many workers in Brazil that they don't want to be, and one of the uh, I think it's one of the major issues in terms of organizing labor around uh, uh, platform work is that many of them don't want to be uh, classified as uh, employees or workers or in terms, they, they see themselves as, as entrepreneurs and etc. cetera. Um, so the thing is, uh, maybe we have some ideological challenges that I think is very important in terms of uh, also helping to organize the labor movement, because uh, also uh, I'm, I'm thinking uh, about the the thing that Rafael said about the the PR and the the, the all the efforts that platforms are doing to uh, uh, counter the the efforts of the labor movement in terms of uh, establishing some uh, uh, basic conditions for fair work, and they are bringing their own uh, concept of uh, decent work, et cetera, or trying to, to impose or to uh, convince people that their standards are better than, than other. Uh, so this, this, how do you, do you uh, think of that uh, uh, in terms of uh, this, ideological uh, challenges that uh, we have. Uh, I had a final question. Um, oh, okay, just a comment. And it's very important to, uh, I like this, this comment that Rafael made about uh, creative workers. I think it's, it's very important to consider uh, also YouTubers, influencers, and people who are working on this, they, they and uh, as workers, and uh, and in, in that sense, the algorithm trans transparency is also a challenge, and uh, also this ideological 
uh, uh, question is also a challenge because they see themselves as creative workers, but they are uh, the, in day to day basis, they are living uh, conditions that very, are very similar to any other uh, platform workers. So just some, not random, but spread comments and uh, thank you for, for your all very insightful comments uh, and presentations. Thanks a lot, Rafael. Um, are there any other questions for the floor? I think it would be useful to take these questions and then come back. No. Okay, uh, let me just go on the reverse order. Yes, uh, uh, I have yeah. a question. Yeah, um, please. I would like Can to you introduce you, yourself. Yeah. And... My name is Wojtek. Uh, I work on Fiverr, which is a platform for freelance services. So it's a global, global platform where people uh, can uh, like do uh, things that are that, that are uh, able to to deliver by by the internet. So this is like a platform where the, the digital work is is mainly done i, I think I, I think this is the the most uh, most um like the biggest platform that there is uh, for such services and i wanted to ask you about your feel like your um, your opinion on it because i know that uh, the the algorithm it, uh, the algorithm uh, like it, the, the the transparency of the algorithm is there because you uh, the the sources that Fiverr gives uh, like everyone can see how the uh, sellers are 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 based uh, like how how the sellers are assessed by their performance so you you can really learn very much uh, how different things that you do influence how the algorithm um, how the algorithm sh shows you on the on the website so um, yeah I, I want to ask about your opinion on fiverr because we we mainly talked about uh, the taxi drivers the the the, uh, the deliveries of food but uh, do you have any opinion on on um, on platforms like fiverr like, like maybe upwork mm -hmm. sure thank you so much uh if I can't see anyone else unless you've raised your hand. If you do, you can raise your hands with the button, reaction button. Okay. So let's go ahead with this round. And if you have any other thoughts, just to put it into the chat box. Let me start uh, from the back and give the floor first to Alina to respond to some of the questions. Uh, that you think you can take up from what Ale uh, from what Rafael posed. Thank you. Um, I guess I will touch on the algorithm transparency point that you raised. Uh, of course, I think it is crucial. And just to give a very simple example, how can we tell whether a platform discriminates or uh, impedes on labor rights if we cannot see how it makes crucial decisions and everything is electronic on platforms. We don't have an employer, so to speak, a human employer to talk to. So, of course, algorithmic transparency is crucial uh, simply to be able to enforce the rights that workers already have. And uh, there was an example of a court decision that uh, concerned the um, the algorithm of platform delivery, which basically, if you had canceled a lot of rides, it deactivated you, but it never asked why you were canceling. So it was clearly thought that this algorithm was discriminatory. And this is kind of why we need algorithm transparency to see that the algorithms and the algorithmic systems basically abide uh, by these rights. Um, yeah, so this is what I, I wanted to comment at the moment. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Alina. Uh, over to you, Rafael, uh, to take the direct questions and also if you would like to comment on any others that were posed by Rafael. Uh, apologies, may I add one thing? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, sure, sure, the, sure. Uh, 
maybe a source of inspiration could also be so in many jurisdictions you have uh, works councils have co-determination co rights when it uh, comes to the introduction of new technologies in the workplace now in the past this was mostly about machines so um, not algorithms so to speak but we could potentially have a similar um, logic applied to algorithms so when an algorithmic system is being implemented to a system that is being used in the workplace workers can have a voice and can ask questions about the technology to make sure that it respects uh, certain rights and apologies this was my only opinion. no worries no worries thanks Alina. Uh, Rafael over to you apologies yeah. Yeah. first of all thank you for your insightful questions and in, in, in provoking uh, thoughts and if, first of all about algorithm transparency uh i agree uh, uh, regarding the, the the importance of put the the algorithm transparency in the um, in the um, in the highlight of the the platform label regulation but um this understanding of transparency uh, algorithm transparency cannot be naive because by standard or by definition, algorithms cannot be fully transparent because maybe my colleagues from law, uh, legal people, understanding maybe this transparency without STS backgrounds about uh, how algorithms really work so uh, uh, I think, I don't know if it's better to talk about algorithm fairness or algorithm justice, uh, uh, but uh, I, I agree, but I, I, don't, I disagree with regarding the name and how this can be um, maybe a, a naive understanding of transparency, but I agree regarding the, the importance of that. I, I, I'm in, in Barcelona now, uh, for a, a short uh, academic mission. And I talked yesterday with the people uh, in Open Data Barcelona here. And, and we, we talked about this, this topic essentially, because how to, and they are working here about algorithm transparency in workplace in the, in the mayor of, of Barcelona here. And this is for me a, a great challenge. And as there is a similar debate on AI ethics area too. And similar debates also regarding PR efforts and regarding how big techs are, are saying they are ethics or saying uh, or, or, or putting the efforts regarding uh, AI ethical. And I agree about uh, the relationships between social regulation of social media platforms and regulation of digital labor platforms. They, these can be more interwoven or interconnected uh, than separate or isolated one. And, and for me, this is a, a great challenge. It's about ideological struggles, um, I always talk about a book from my colleague, uh, Callum Kent, Riding for Deliveroo. In, in his book, Callum Kent uh, put and, and, and highlights Brazilian workers in, U in the UK seven times. In the first time, he talks about, whoa, Brazilian workers are starting strikes in the UK. Whoa, the first strike in the UK uh, born in WhatsApp groups of Brazilian workers. In the seventh time, Callum can't say, well, but they are supporters of Bolsonaro. So uh, uh, the workers organizing and the ideological struggles are very complex, even in uh, a Brazilian context. And uh, a colleague of mine, Sheru Soriano from Philippines, say about uh, entrepreneurial solidarities. It's contradictory, but uh, uh, this uh, uh, play in, in WhatsApp groups on, and on the streets about how the workers at the same time uh, have organizing solidarities, emerging solidarities, and at the same time 
and neoliberal and entrepreneurial rationality uh, regarding their own classification as workers and so on. On the one hand, um, we cannot put, uh, okay, we are researchers and we know that the workers want, uh, because I, I, I see many researchers saying the workers are wrong, the workers, Okay, uh, uh, but how to understand these contradictions um, and to 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 put the, the this thing? Uh, I uh, th there are many workers saying to us, "I'm not entrepreneur, but I'm trying to survive," and like a, a, a survival management of of their lives, as uh, I said, my another colleague Ludmila Abilio regarding entrepreneurial. Uh, rationality. Uh, so uh, uh, this is a uh, um, ideological struggle around the world. Uh, here in in Barcelona, I, I face the same thing uh, in the the, the riders' uh, struggles here. Uh, maybe with not without Bolsonaro supporters, but with with similar challenges. And for me, another gap is regarding uh, understanding YouTubers and influencers as workers. Uh, there are many emerging worker organizing in these areas like YouTubers Union in, in Germany and Creators Union in the UK, uh, claiming for algorithm transparency too, uh, and clear rules regarding regarding demonetization and now i have an student researching how fair work principles can relate to work of streamers on on twitch and it, it's interesting thing about uh twitch workers organizing in brazil because in the the in in this year uh, the Twitch streamers uh, organized a strike here, uh, there in, 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 in Brazil. And first of all, they built a Twitch union. But many streamers don't, does not like the left wing and does not, don't, don't like the term union because it's more near than left wing and, and so on. And they changed the name. Uh, from uh, streamers union to streamers association or streamers, I don't remember the, the exact name, to put we are not from left wing. So this is another example about ideological challenges regarding workers organizing here. And maybe a spoiler, uh, soon we will start to score and evaluate uh, uh, in fair work platforms such as OnlyFans. Uh, and this can be very important in a very uh, interesting and look forward to discuss with you uh, in the future. Thank you, Rafael, for your intervention. And uh, we have just about 12 minutes to go. So what I'm gonna do is quickly respond to the questions that I've got from Rafael, as well as the colleague on the floor and uh, Alexandra, and I'll hand it over to you, Rafael, back uh, for the closing remarks. Uh, I want to pick on the algorithmic management transparency issue too, and I understand Ra Rafael Groman has his own view. I think when one talks about a need for algorithmic transparency, there are two things that are very important and fundamental to know. What is the data that is being used for training and the algorithm? And I think this is fundamental and very important. And this is not something very difficult to make transparent. The second thing is, what are the conditions that are actually imposed to result in the kind of outcomes that come by. And again, these conditions can be open and discussed. I don't think there is nothing within the condition that cannot be discussed. And also, what is the kind of regulatory environment? And this regulatory environment can 
uh, it, it could be regulatory environment, but it could also be an economic environment, depending upon the kind of ideology that exists, that allows something like that to go on without actually questioning it. So for me, when we think about transparency, I think about the conditions, I think about the data, and I do feel that some of this can be easily made available, which is at the moment not. One can argue that these are part of the uh, see, uh, trade secret laws, uh, say trade secrets of the companies, but minimum conditions can be easily disclosed as to, you know, how do you come up with the kind of outcomes that you have in the end? And I think this is again open for debate. The second issue with regard to labor regulation and platform regulation, I'm gonna pick on what Alexandra asked me and answer it together. Now, the way the ILO framework works, we cannot set up regulations overnight. There's a process that is followed. And the process is that this item has to come up for a discussion at the governing body. And we've had two discussions now for now almost two years to whether we could even have a technical expert meeting on the subject. And finally, we've got an approval this year. And the two reports that were brought out, one in 2018 on microtask platforms and this global one, looking at a whole range of platforms were actually towards pushing for a technical expert meeting. So you need to build evidence within the ILO with regard to the subject and then make the request. And once you have the technical expert meeting, and this is where uh, the importance of countries in the global South really comes in. So the expert meeting consists of members. It's not, an, uh, it's not the entire general assembly, but it is groups of select countries, uh, uh, groups of workers from certain parts of the world, and similarly, employers from different parts of the world. What they try to do is not to have the worker, employer, and the government from the same country, but they disperse it because we have 189 member states as part of the ILO. So there's a representation process that goes on. And you have countries from Latin America, Africa, Europe, Asia, Americas actually represented, which speak for that particular group. So we have the GRULAC members from Latin America who speak, Asia Pacific for the entire Asia, then you have the Africa group. So your views, whatever you have, either as a government representative or a worker or an employer representative is actually led and communicated in the technical expert meeting where a decision will be then taken whether this item is up for discussion at the labor conference in coming two years for a single or a double discussion for which then you can set up a convention which basically then lays down what are the rules of the game, what are the regulatory situation, what needs to be done. So it's a process. It'll take a number of years for it to happen. We are hoping that this item gets picked up for at least a discussion in the ILC in 2024 or 2025. And even then it'll take two years. Now it can happen that after discussion, a, a double discussion of two years that the GB, the uh, conference decides not to have a convention, which has happened in the case of global supply chains in the past. So we'll have to see how this entire process goes and we reach there. For us, the EU directive is really, really important within that context. And we do hope that we can make uh, some uh, you know, move there. The third issue that I do want to talk about, which was raised not to me, but I do think I wanted to raise it actually earlier, is a whole issue around creative workers, YouTubers, social media platform workers, tweet streamers, and all of it. I think they're all very invisible workers, uh, but I think one needs to actually have a better understanding as to the nature of work, the time spent, the kind of working conditions they have, the kind of earnings that they have before we can get them into a larger regulatory issue, a larger regulatory question. Because I think that's something that we do hear about it, we do see it, but I think there's a bit more research to be done in a systematic manner. We tried touching the subject, but we felt that it is not easy to get onto it because there's not really any data that is available. But I think we need to have a much 
better understanding because you do have, I've seen uh, YouTube videos where parents use children to come up uh, to do a video and that generates a hell of a lot of money. So, you know, there's a whole lot of things that are happening in the YouTube that one needs to really come down and start understanding what is it for income earning activities, what is being done for pressure, what is being done for other purposes, because there's a whole lot of things happening there. And finally, with regard to platforms like Fiverr, actually, uh, I could ask Alina to put it onto the chat, into the chat, the link to our global report that we published in uh, February 2021. Uh, we do go and have a real deep dive into freelance and contest-based platforms uh, where uh, you find that the situation is probably not so very different from what you see on taxi and uh, ride-hailing platforms. What is rather worse is what we see is that on online labor platforms, what is happening is you as a worker is competing with the global labor force. So, you know, you end up underbidding, you end up doing tasks for free, largely because you want to have a good rating, largely because you want to be able to access work. So I think it gets even worse there. And what we have also found is that ratings alone is not sufficient and you need a whole range of other things to actually be able to even access jobs. So there are much more vulnerabilities that you see among these platform workers on online. And that is something that we really need to take head on. And many of them are very highly qualified. And that's an issue that that's where I come back and say that while we sort of handle our regulations for digital platforms and similar work, I think at the same time, we need to have a very clear integrated policy framework for employment policies along with industrial and technology policies, because without it, you know, we cannot really address this problem. The way, the reason why we have ended up with this problem is because of the massive unemployment that we have. But at the same time, we need to remind ourselves that none of the jobs that we are doing on platforms are new. They're all being done in the traditional labor market, continue to be done in the traditional labor market. And what the platform is doing is only mediating it. And it cannot use that mediating role to say that it is creating employment. And I think with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much. Thank you, Uma. Uh, I was informed that uh, maybe in three minutes, they will automatically cut off our transmission. <laughs> so that says something about management. And uh, I will hand out the, the floor to you. I, I, Please, uh, I'll, I'll ask you to make some brief uh, finding, uh, closing statements, saying your goodbyes. And uh, please, Alina, may you start? Uh, well, thank you very much again for having me here today. Uh, it, was, it has been a very interesting discussion and presentations. And um, I guess what I'd like to say is that uh, what I've always found interesting, at least for uh, about platform work, is that I think it will be the battlefield in many ways for the future of work. So all the things that are being discussed around the platform economy, what to do about technology in the workplace, how it controls workers, what we discuss for platforms will be important in the future. And it will be important to ensure protection for forms of work perhaps that we can't even imagine now that will be touched by technology in perhaps even worse ways uh, than the platform work. Um, I guess that sounds a bit gloomy, but uh, thank you again for having me here today. Thank you, Alina. Please, Rafael. So thank you so much for having me. And, and for me, this topic is also a better field for uh, internet governance to because in, in many times, uh, the future of work and the future of internet or future of technology are, uh, were understood as isolated or something, um, something other thing and, and, and so on. And we can connect these things. And this, this, were, this was uh, an interesting space to discuss and to put it and connect these things. 
about regulation and about to, to promote uh, decent work in, in platform labor. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rafael. Please, Uma. Thank you so much, Rafael. And it was a pleasure to be here. Thanks for this opportunity and for this very interesting discussion. I'm just end by saying that I think it's very important for us from the Global South to think about quality of work, both in terms of working conditions and content of work. And for me, the future of work is here. Let's not say that we look into it, but try to address the issues now. Thank you so much for organizing this event. Thank you, Uma. So thanks again to Alina, Rafael, and Uma. Uh, thank you all for uh, that are uh, in the attendance. It was uh, a very good discussion. And uh, that's it. Thank you. Bye-bye.